Hey everyone, Raylan here. I have what I think is kind of a unique interview for you today. I am really excited about it. It's with Dan Neufer. For those of you who aren't aware, Dan Neufer is the creator of the ANS Rewire program and the author of the book CFS Unraveled. And he has been working with people and helping them to recover from conditions like ME-CFS for uh, I believe decades now. So he just has a lot of insight on this topic. We decided to do this because we finished another interview and after we hung up and stopped recording, I felt like we had the best conversation and I thought this, this is what people need to be hearing. Why don't we have these discussions when the camera's on? Um, this real talk sort of when we let our guard down and just speak really um, truthfully about our experience of health and recovery. I think you know that was one of the couple of reasons we thought it was important to have this chat. You know, one about the images people are portraying in the public eye and social media and how that makes us feel about our own lives. And then just how the world around us impacts our health and recovery. Sometimes we get in this little healing bubble of communities of people who are really focused and it feels like yes, but then you go out in kind of the greater population. And you know, the example I gave is that I go to WeWork often because I work remote, but I get tired of being at home. And I'm there and really what everyone does is just sit on their laptop all day, you know, for eight, nine hours and just stare at their laptop. But I make a point of taking a break at lunch to go out in the sun, put my feet in the grass, and I take a, make a point to have a meditation spot that I've found to, to go and meditate because I find that's something that helps me with my stress levels. But many days I don't want to do it. And I look around and I'm like, nobody else in this entire place is taking a break to go get some sunshine. Like, why should I have to do it? So I feel like it can be really hard to stay on a healthy path, whether you're in something like ME-CFS recovery or long COVID recovery, or even when you're fully healthy, when everything around you, it feels like everything that's normal you're being is, weird, is what right? you should not be doing. Yes, it's like, what is normal is toxic so much of the time. Yeah. You know, like, what do you do? Absolutely. How do you how do you manage this? And how, how do you stay on track despite the world leading you <laughs> elsewhere? The first thing is you've really got to consider your tribe. I mean, who do you hang around with? And what kind of job do you have? And where do you work? Right? What is the culture at your job? What is the culture at uh, in that uh, uh, industry? Yes. And, and then you gotta say, do I really want to be in that? And then even when you find the right industry and a good work, reasonable work culture, I mean, I have to say reasonable. See, I can't say good. I can't bring myself to say good because it's pretty hard to find good. I mean, you're not going to find good maybe, but let's say reasonable. But I mean, certainly let's say even if you work, let's say you work in an accountant's office, I can promise you there'll be some accountant's office where the boss goes home at five o'clock and there's some accountant's office where the boss goes home at eight. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to work in the accountant's office that the boss goes home at eight, you will not have balance in your life. That's, that's just, you, you're gonna be expected to do that. There's gonna be pressure. It's not gonna be good. If you go and work somewhere where the boss says, yeah, I'll go home at five, I think it's time to go home and see the kids. Then you have much more chance to be in the right work culture. We've got to really make those choices about our friends. And that can be hard. I think that is probably one of the most important things that you can do. And I remember when I first got sick and I was working on my recovery and, you know, I cut out all alcohol, all kind of junk food and all that toxic stuff. And I thought, what am I going to do? This is all the people I hang around with do. And kind of a harsh reality, I guess, for me at the time was that some of those people kind of drifted out of my life because once we didn't have that in common, but the good thing was, is that once I set my focus on healthier things, I started attracting those kind of people into my life. You know, exactly. once I'm going to yoga classes, I'm hanging out with other people that like to do yoga and value that kind of thing. If I'm going to meditation classes, I'm, me I'm meeting people who enjoy that. And even to this day, I find it really important because, you know, if you're hanging around with people who ha live unhealthy uh, lifestyles, things that are not in line with, with what is healthy that we know for us, down is such a much easier direction to go like it takes self-control and discipline to stay on track and if everyone around you is just like Meh, you know it's just it's, it's really hard to keep that up so, but if everyone around you is kind of at that same place or higher you know you're not getting dragged down well, it's not just that you're getting one. dragged down it's actually really hard n not to do the right things yeah 
Because if I'm hanging around with a bunch of people who eat salads, I mean, where am I going to order that hamburger with chips? Yeah. Right? I mean, it, 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 if they will want to catch up on the weekend and go hike up the mountain and have a picnic up there, then how am I going to have that boozing session? Right? Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I have all kinds of friends and some are like that. But, and, uh, but I can guarantee that when I catch up with them, you know, a copious amount of alcohol is poured into my glass that, that it just doesn't end, right? And it's like, you've got to say, well, how much of my time do I want to do this kind of thing? Do I really want to expose myself to that? So, yeah, making those choices is, is it's not easy, but you've you got to say, how does it feel? How do I want to live? And it also comes from a mental point of view. It's not just about bad health habits. It's about what kind of mindset yeah, if I have to, you know, show how amazing I am all the time and look at how perfect my house is, look how perfect my car is, look how perfect my job is, look how perfect my body is. When you're hanging around with everybody who's being like that, mm -hmm. you're going to feel that pressure because you're going to look terrible this is true. <laughs> if you're not focused on that all the time. It creates a pressure. And yeah, I, I thought it was very interesting because because uh, I saw you had a video that you did recently where you had a bit of a bump with your recovery and, uh, and, and you spoke a little bit about that. And, and you, when we spoke, you mentioned an interesting phrase from your, from your book about how you thought you would never engage in life in an unhelpful way again, right? You know, I wrote in my book about my recovery, I'm like, I've learned my lessons, I've had 10 years of you know, hell and I've just come such a long way and I will never go back to those things. I'm a new person now. Um, I just don't live my life in the same way. But then when health returns and the demands of life come back, I found it very easy to fall back into old patterns. And before I knew it, I was, you know, um, yeah, just working really long hours, not taking really great care of myself and just running myself into the ground again, exactly what I said I'd never do. Don't, don't worry, Raylan, my, my wife uh, regularly reminds me to watch my own program. <laughs> So yeah, look, um, and uh, there's a couple of reasons why. So uh, yes, it's great to be cognizant about what are the problems, behaviors. Um, what led us to becoming ill in the first place? And, and, and obviously these things impact other people too with all kinds of illness. How does this happen? You know, because it sounded, what you just said and even what I just kind of said about what my wife reminded me of, it sounds a bit like self-blame, right? And the issue is this, we recover and we become normal, right? Normal. We can engage in life normally again. Mm -hmm. But normal isn't normal. And I'm not talking in the context of evolution over the last 10,000 years or something like this. But if I spoke to my grandfather and showed him how I live my life, he would just think I'm absolutely crazy. Like, what is wrong with you? And and so we don't tend to think of this because, well, we just live life normally like everybody else, right? But if I said to my grandfather that I do this and I do that for like an hour, he'd be like, there's something wrong with you, right? But you go into any household and look at the people in front of the TV and that's what they're doing, barely breathing sitting without moving an arm, a finger, nothing like this for hour, maybe multiple hours. It's, it's like we need to enjoy things in a reasonable period of time, not binge like this. Look at the way people all engage in work. We have a toxic work culture, yes, right? And what are we doing most of the time at work, right? We have a mouse in our hand and we're doing this. <laughs> it's, it's unnatural. And then there's, I think, the whole issue with, with uh, social media. It's all about if anybody compares themselves to everybody else, their life is terrible, useless, and less than everybody else. But the everybody else they look at, their lives are all, it's almost, it's kind of fake, right? Because you're looking at all these highlights. Oh, look at me when I'm like on a balloon yeah. ride. Look at me when I'm doing this and this and this. And, and then some people will seek to have those experiences and they're almost living for the Instagram post as opposed to actually being in the moment, yeah? And I mean, it's great to share these things and it's not all negative. 
and that's the problem. It's obviously not bad. It's obviously very good for many reasons, and it's fun, and it's nice and positive, and we can share things, and inspire each other. But there is this underlying toxicity of excessive comparison. I think there's another part to that too, especially for people like us who put ourselves out there publicly in the publicly to talk about health. Because one of my goals with everything that I share is to put goodness out into the world around things that will promote health and happiness. So these are the types of posts that I share. And you know, one of my friends who is a health coach, Pamela Rose, she contacted me recently and she said, it was so helpful one of your newsletters that you sent out. She had a client that just got a, a puppy and her life turned upside down and she wasn't taking care of herself. <laughs> and I had just sent out a newsletter talking about, because I just got a puppy, if you hear some background noise, that's him tearing the place up. Mm. And I wasn't taking care of myself. Like I just wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating healthy. I just, I was a mess. And she said, wow, this makes me so much better because of Raylan, who was just the epitome of like health and self care. If this can happen That's to right. her. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, if I'm putting out the message that I'm the epitome of health and self care, like exactly. I'm not giving an accurate image of my life because I am not, I, I am not, I'm far from perfect. I sometimes eat crap. I sometimes drink too much wine. I sometimes don't get enough sleep. <laughs> I'm sometimes working too hard. Well, the other thing is, you know, uh, the body image stuff. Yeah. All right. All the guys, we've got to be ripped, have big muscles, great hairlines, right? <laughs> all this kind of stuff. Right. And like, what, what do we, what do we do about this? Right. So it's not just from social media. It's in our culture. It's yeah. really deep, deep in our culture. And so my point was when people say, oh, I've strayed, I've messed up, I should have known better. I learned all these lessons from my recovery. Now I'm recovered. I'm not doing these things. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of hard when everybody around you is not everybody, but I would say the majority of people are living life in an unbalanced, unhealthy way. So it's not like we are the uh, weird people who stray from living a sensible, balanced life. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. We, we are immersed in it. And, and so it's important to give yourself, a, a, I think, a break when you realize that you mess up. Now, in the program, we often talk about, you know, why did, it's all around saying, why did I become ill? And it's not about blame. And often there can be all kinds of things, like we talked about in the other video, with infections and accidents. and you know, It's a complicated illness. But a lot of the time, it's actually a whole multitude of things i.e. we already have before the trigger comes a high level of of stress yeah mm -hmm. and why would you have a high level of stress and people always say i had a high level of stress because blah 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 and that blah 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 every reasonable person would say well of course i understand that this was a high stress situation that would be high stress for everyone mm -hmm. It'd be high stress for everyone to lose a loved one a high stress for everyone to have a boss that was abusive. Uh, it'd be high stress for everyone to be in a relationship that we, you were um, being you know, uh, treated badly in. And then it's easy to say, well, it's because of that that I then got sick. But when we try and find a way to take uh, some responsibility as much as we can, we become empowered. Yeah, we become empowered. And you say, because the truth is, life gives you messages that something is wrong and you don't listen. It's very simple. You say, oh, I overworked. Well, you overworked, but didn't you feel sleepy? Yeah, yeah, I felt a bit sleepy. Well, that, why didn't you go just go home and lie down and have a snooze, right? And it's like, <laughs> that's crazy, right? What are we talking about? I had to get stuff done. So we didn't listen to our body because we had to do this and this and this. Mm -hmm. Then we started to feel unwell. We didn't listen to our body because, and we couldn't understand what is the because. Is it because I needed to achieve? Is it because I needed to please others? Is it because it's what my parents expected from me? Is it because I felt I was not very good if I didn't do a good job? Was it because I wasn't happy unless I got to do this? Like climbing a mountain to the Himalayas or uh, you know, I mean, I'm talking about positive things, not just yeah. negative things. But body, life, stress, relationships all give you feedback and we ignore it because we're not, because something is driving us. An internal motivation is driving us to keep going despite the messages that we're getting. And 
if we don't resolve what is driving that internal motivation for a more positive outcome, then we are bound to make the same mistake again. It'll just come in a different way. This is where, you know, people talk about label that psychology or whatever, but this is essential, right? If I have a, if I get like, I don't know, have a heart attack because I've been working 19 hour days and and, 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 and as a stock trader for 10 years, and I, I get fixed up by the doctor and then say, okay, excellent. So now I'm going to start my career as an administrator in a COVID ward whilst I then go off and work as a air traffic controller. <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong, right? <laughs> so we got to learn. Yeah. We got to make some changes on the inside to change our behavior uh, to protect ourselves from. And, and, and we talk about toxic relationships, right? You are in a relationship, right? If you're in a toxic relationship, you're in it. If you're in a job where the boss is abusive, mm -hmm. you are in that. Some people might say, "Wow, this is crazy. What are you talking to me? You're yelling at me? What? Yeah. I'm out of here. Other people say, oh, I can't leave my job. I can't. Maybe I can't find another job. Yeah, there's different ways of responding to a stressor. Now, if, if your boss is yelling at you, making you feel bad and saying you're silly and stupid and all this kind of thing, that's terrible for a day, it's terrible for a week, but do, do you, was it the right choice to be in that situation for three years right. until you had a nervous breakdown, for example, right? Or could I have made a different choice? And so if I could have made a different choice, which we know you could have because, you know, half your colleagues left, then the question is, why didn't you? Mm -hmm. I think understanding these things is really important. Yeah, I think this has been the biggest takeaway in my experience with this of, you know, the, the difference with how I live my life now. And it's obviously far from perfect. It's never going to be. And recognizing that, that life is still sometimes going to knock you sideways for a little bit. But it's having that conscious approach to how you're living your life versus just having life happen to you. Like, I think so many of us start going through life almost like a puppet being pulled in different directions, like a bag in the wind. Like, we don't feel like we're in control of much, and we're not consciously thinking about the routines and the habits and the situations and the relationships that we have. So it's taking those times, whether, that time, whether it's through, like, journaling or counseling or silent reflection or whatever works for you, conversations with your partner, but just to check in once in a while and be like, how are things going? <laughs> Is this still working for me? Does my current friend group work for me? Is my job a good fit for me? Um, and paying attention to those warning signs when they come up, like you were saying, because before I would go potentially years and just power through. You know, I got myself, I, I felt like I was on a bit of a path to burnout a while back, but I didn't wait long. Like I started seeing those check engine lights come on and I paid attention to them a lot more quickly. And for staying on track in a world where it seems designed to get you off track health-wise, one of the things that helps me a lot is just having conversations with people and making verbal contracts. Like once we say things out loud, you know, like this weekend we're going to go hiking or this, like what, what are we going to do with our time? And I also find when it feels like so much of the world seems destined to pull you off track, lots of other people feel the same way as you do. And when you start... Of course start these conversations, start behaving in um, healthier ways and normalizing things like whether it be not drinking or eating healthier food or going hiking versus clubbing, other people are relieved, you know, because even current friends of mine, one of mine recently, you know, we went out for dinner with a group and it, at the end she's like, oh, I was saying to myself on the way here, only one glass of wine, do not let anyone else, you know, pressure you into more. And I'm like, I was telling myself the same thing. Like, why don't we talk about this more? Like, I think a lot of us are just, bending to peer pressure, even in our 40s, which is crazy. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And, you know, so well said, Raylan. I totally agree with you. And, and, and the other thing is, it's about recognizing that we have choice. You see, we don't realize we have a choice. We actually think we distort reality and say, there is no choice. I have a mortgage, a business, I, I couldn't do another job. There's no other jobs. I have no choice. And here's something I always say to people. If that was your child at your age in that same situation, I guess you'd just say to them, well, sweetheart, you don't have a choice. I guess just keep going until you have a heart attack, a stroke, nervous breakdown, you know, and you have no choice. Would you say that? 
And people always laugh. No way. Of course not. There's no way. So we impose a different reality on our loved ones about what choices are available, right? And what possibilities exist. But on, when we look through our own glass, you know, our own uh, vision uh, through our own eyes at the world, the choices get limited. They get distorted. And and sometimes we, I think we need to pull ourselves up by the scruff of our neck and just take a look above and go, hang on a sec. This is, is, do I have a choice? Could it be different? And, and so choices are about just sometimes seeing the gray and looking for something different. And uh, I think we're not really conditioned to do that these days. It's very comfortable being either black or white. And I found this with MECFS recovery with things like diet, you know, because I explored different things. And for quite a while, I found a plant-based diet to be very helpful for me. But in time, 100% plant-based didn't feel right. You know, I'm still largely plant-based, but not entirely. But I really wanted to have that label of either, like, so when people say, what are you? Are you vegetarian? Are you vegan? Are you paleo? Um, but sometimes, a lot of times, the answer for us is somewhere in that gray, which can be an uncomfortable place to be. We, we want that, that clarity. It's like railing. You have no friends. Yeah. Right? Where like, do I belong? If, you, if you're eating that, the paleo people might not like you. The yeah. vegan people won't like yeah. you. The carnivores won't like yeah. you. Well, you're just going, oh, just eat all kinds of food. It's like, you've got no friends, right? Yeah, and I think it's built into our you know, evolutionary psychology to like find yes. your tribe and don't de like make sure they accept you. Um, but in this complex world, that doesn't really work. And with MECFS recovery, mm -hmm. another piece of that, which I, I think I heard you saying, is that you know, it's difficult because it requires us quite often to get up every day and make different choices than we did the day before, which is really uncomfortable. In the short term, it's so much easier to just get up on autopilot and do the same things you've always done. It's really challenging to question things, and questioning things might mean that you might have to make some hard decisions, which is going to make things probably more stressful in the short term. So, you know, it's just there's so many elements to chronic illness recovery that I... I don't think we talk about a lot like we talk about it does vegan work does that work but you know how do we navigate that how do we make these changes how do we exist in a world that isn't necessarily conducive to health um, so we can put out all this information for people to follow but if they don't know how to live that in their everyday life it's I mean, almost like setting people up to fail absolutely and, and look here's I think a thing to recognize the fact if you listen to this video you're 50% of the way there with having done nothing. Because you already, first we got to know what is the problem. Mm -hmm. And I honestly believe that is half the journey, literally half. Because people who don't even know what the problem is, what are their chances of being able to change, right? They just, they, they'll just go, oh, I'm not making good choices, therefore I'm being weak or I'm, I'm, I'm you know, they feel bad about themselves. And this is not helpful, this isn't kind, this is not nice. You wouldn't do this to your friend or your child, right? So recognize first of all, okay, this is, everyone's got these problems. It's not just me. Everyone makes bad choices, not just me. That's the first thing. And then the second thing to recognize is, recognize you've got choice and you're going to just take some, some strong steps. And it's like, a, it's like a muscle, right? To be an individual is not encouraged in our society anymore, right? I feel, that's my feeling. I feel it's not encouraged. So if you, it feels uncomfortable, right? But for you to make your own choices and to create your own tribes and perhaps become a leader, yeah? Maybe that's your calling. Maybe that's where you come out of this illness is that you become a leader. And I see that with so many people who recover from this illness. I always say to people in, in, in the program, hey, uh, if you want to find some people who've recovered, go and see your local um, uh, therapist, uh, uh, acupuncturist, <laughs> naturopath, um, uh, you know? Pilates teacher, yoga teacher, and there you'll have someone who's recovered, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what I take away from all of this, you know, for people watching, if any of if anything is helpful from my own experience, you know, how I navigate this crazy world, trying to stay healthy. I mean, one is just not expecting perfection from myself. When I first came out of my recovery, I think I did. Like, I'm like, I've learned all these lessons. I'm never going to make a mistake again. And that's just not realistic. You just can't be perfect. And sometimes things come up in life. You get a new puppy. You have a child. You, something happens. And, you know, you just you can't stick to everything perfectly. But the things that keep me on track, I mean, even when things do go sideways, is shaping my environment 
and having a lot of habits and routines. Because I find even when things do go sideways, even if half my routines go out the window, half still stay. So, and it's sort of like there's a muscle memory, so it's not so hard for me to bring them back in. And I don't expect myself to fix it overnight, I just bring back in one at a time. Like, okay, I'm no longer stretching in the morning. Next week, let's start that. And then after proving to myself that I can stick with it for a week, I have more confidence in my ability to bring something else back in. Like, okay, now let's you know, bring in that lunchtime walk again or whatever it might be. And just shape, taking control of my environment and having honest conversations with the people around me, like my husband. I'm like, I can't have ice cream in the apartment right now because I'm in a place where everything's falling apart and I'm going to have it for breakfast if it's there. <laughs> so the habits, shaping my environment, and then, like you said, you know, really thinking hard about the people I surround myself with because that's going to determine you know, how I live my life. What about for you? What are the key Absolutely. things that, that keep you, you on track? Yeah, look, uh, I love your focus on, 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 on practical strategies. Uh, I think for me, I think the key thing is keeping the goal front of mind. I mean, forget about actually how much you get there and how good you are at doing it and all of this kind of thing. But we need to keep the goal of living healthy and balanced front of mind. And just by having that, then every time you screw up, it's kind of feels uncomfortable because it it's... It's in conflict with what you're saying is your goal. And we forget about the goal because we get caught up in a new goal. Something else becomes more important suddenly, and that's how we forget it. So I think having that front of mind is, is the biggest step. And, and the next thing is we need uh, habits and we need um, a structure. Um, I think you were already pointing that out in, in what you were saying. But um, I'm going to go to the gym like all the time. I'm going to go to the gym every day. And then one day I don't go because I can't, because something happened or I didn't want to, I didn't feel well, or whatever it is, right? And then now I've managed to do something that I, uh, I, to not do something I should. And it becomes easier, right? I said I would go every day, now I didn't. So now I'm, it's become easier to fail. But if I say I have to only go on Mondays, and the Monday comes, you see, now I don't have that choice. Oh, should I go Monday today? Do I not go? I'm going most days. Is today one of those days? See, if you go most days, every day is the day you don't go. Yeah. <laughs> if you go Mondays, you go Mondays. Yeah. And so structure, I think, is really important. Yes, yes, 100%. Well, I'm glad we had this talk. Stan, you and I, I always feel we have the best conversations after we stop recording and I always think this so, was the good stuff this is what we should be getting out there so we thought let's just go for it and <laughs> tackle this topic and see where it takes us I'm glad we switched the recording button back on. yeah <laughs> well I appreciate uh, how candid you've been I hope something in here was helpful for people watching I'd love to hear what do you think what are your experiences what throws you off track or what keeps you on track you know what what are your, your insights in all of this because our community, our MECFS, you know, long haulers, all, all these different, you know, similar conditions are some of the most well-informed people on the planet and are just so knowledgeable and have so much insight about this whole process. So you guys are a wealth of information. So I'd love to hear what you have to say. And yeah, um, if you want to know more about Dan, he's been on the channel before. I'll link some playlists with some other videos and all of his information about, you know, his incredible ANS Rewire program will be in the video description about uh, his book CFS Unraveled uh, and all the social spaces that you can find him and learn more. So yeah, thanks again, Dan. This is this has been great. You're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> all right, that is it for today. Uh, goodbye, everyone. I'll see you in the next video.